IP, like many other network systems, is a packet technology. IP takes contiguous bytes from streams of data and collects them into chunks called packets. Some network technologies like IP call these packets datagrams. The packets, or datagrams, are now given some control bytes called the packet header. The packet header contains various bits of control information. Included in this is the addressing information required to get the packets to their destination. They also have a sender's address so that the destination knows where to send the replies to. It is this header that is the internet protocol and is therefore referred to as the IP header. This concept of each packet in a stream being routed towards the address contained in its header means that IP works in what is called connectionist mode. This means that each packet is routed as a separately addressed message. The devices that use the addresses to figure out where to send an IP packet next are called routers, pronounced routers in America and Australia. The symbol commonly used to represent a router in network diagrams looks like a disk with a cross in it. It is because IP is connectionist that IP packets are technically referred to as datagrams, though today they are often simply called packets. Now IP was designed to send short messages between endpoints, and in its original military role it was perfect, as packets would get to their destination even if the network sustained some damage. However, where each packet is part of a larger real-time stream such as voice over IP, today's IP as designed in 1981 is not so good without some help. So IP relies on the destination address being contained in the header of each IP packet. So let's look at this address in a bit more detail. IP forwards packets on a hop-by-hop -hop basis to the destination computers. Remember, the devices that do this are called routers. An IP destination is called the host and is identified by a 32-bit IP address. Although routers and computers, otherwise known as hosts, read the IP address in binary, humans read it in dotted decimal. In this example, the IP address of a PC or host computer is 1100000110100110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110110
or a set of commands an application developer can use to get to their applications communicating across a network. IP generally does not distinguish between these top three layers. Rather, they are collectively referred to as simply the application. The transport layer identifies the correct application to deliver the packet content to by use of an application identifier called the port number. Applications that come bundled with TCP IP are referred to as well-known ports. IP refers to the bottom two layers simply as the physical network layer, and layer 3 itself simply as the internet layer. In general though, for the four bottom layers, most people stick with the seven layer model names. Here we're going to see this in operation as we follow the progress of a packet from a web browsing application on a PC requesting a web page from a web server. The well-known port for web browsing or hypertext transfer protocol HTTP is port 80. As the packet drops through the layers, each layer, if needed, is often implemented by the addition of control bytes or headers. As data from the application reaches the transport layer, the layer 4 header is added. You can see it is requesting a session on port 80. At the network layer, the IP header is added, which, as we've already said among other things, contains the destination IP address of the web server. In this case, it's 10.32.4.5. Layer 2 will add a header and in most cases a trailer. In this case the data link protocol is Ethernet. Finally the packet is ready to be sent onto the LAN towards the local gateway router. At the local gateway router the layer 2 protocol bytes are removed. In order to identify the next hop towards the destination as much of the IP address as required is matched against a lookup database called the routing table and the packet is forwarded towards the next hop link. In this example, the layer 2 protocol of this link is PPP, or point-to-point -point protocol. So the PPP bytes are added, and the packet forwarded. At the next router, the PPP bytes are removed, and again as much of the IP address as necessary is examined to determine the next hop. Exactly how much of the IP address that needs to be examined is specified by a device called the subnet mask. In this example, these first two routers have only needed to look at the first two bytes of the IP address. The next hop is identified and the appropriate layer 2 protocol is added. Here it is frame relay. The next router is the gateway router for the destination web server. As before, the layer 2 bytes are removed. However, this time the subnet mask in this router specifies that the first three bytes need to be examined. The final hop from the router to the server is Ethernet. So accordingly, the Ethernet bytes are added and the packet sent to the web server of IP address 10.32.4.5. As the packet goes up through the layers in the receiving server, the respective layers' control bytes are processed and removed until the packet's content reaches the web server software where the requested web page is retrieved and returned back to the originating PC in the same way. So, how did the router know how much of the address to look at? Well, as we've said, routers and PCs know how much of the IP address to look at by means of a thing called a subnet mask. The subnet mask is a sort of a filter that specifies the number of bits of an IP address that are needed to make the routing decision for a particular hop. OK, so how do routers that are not directly connected to a network get to know about it in their routing tables? Well, this can either be done statically by manually logging into the routers in turn and configuring their routing tables not surprisingly this is called static routing or on a large network where this is not practical it is common practice for routers to be configured with routing protocols this is where the routers automatically update each other on a regular basis and this is called dynamic routing so let's assume that a routing protocol has been configured on routers 3, 2 and 1 when router 3 is connected to the LAN whose addresses all begin with 10.32.4, router 3 puts it into its local routing tables and uses the routing protocol to tell router 2 about the new subnetwork. Router 2 puts updates into its routing table and tells router 1 which updates its routing table. 